Thank you, Simon, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, just a quick introduction. Uh, like Carla, uh, I've done this talk before at IATEFL, but it was this year, not a couple of years ago, and it was a co-talk with another presenter, my colleague and friend at King's, Nick Anden, but it's just me today. I know some of you saw the talk at IATEFL, and I hope you enjoyed it, because it's double the length. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> But I've got some pit stops where you can do some work. But yeah, I'm, I'm not here with Nick today, but Nick was involved, well, Nick actually set up this research project. Uh, I joined in sort of mid-time. Uh, there's another person here who's been involved in it as well. I'll check if they want to be uh, named. It's Richard. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, you can ask us questions afterwards. Um, so it's about uh, working with emergent language. It is a research project. So a lot of it at this stage is quite theoretical and numerical and sort of data driven. I've got some practical ideas to give you at the end, but they are their ideas. We haven't sort of got much, we haven't sort of got to the phase where people are working on this in their own teaching yet, but hopefully this is the start of it. Um, so before I start talking about emergent language, I'm going to just sort of deal with a phrase, a, a term, uh, the term focus on form. Uh, they're often sort of used uh, to mean the same thing. They're used kind of against each other. Um, focus on form really is the sort of the, the mix of um, meaningful practice, communication, interaction, and those little moments when you focus on language. Okay, so it's so there's a sort of as as long. This is Long's quote. There's a brief interjection about form, and those interjections, those forms, are referred to as emerging language. Or, but the thing is, no one sort of claimed the term emergent or emerging language. It's it's a strange thing. It's kind of out there in the teaching world, but in the research world, focus on form is there. So I'm going to sort of I'm going to be talking about emerging language all the time today, but. In the literature, it's focused on form. I prefer the term emerging language, partly because it really makes sense to teachers, but also because Long has focus on form and focus on forms. And I think to separate two really distinct things by a single letter is really confusing. And when people ask me what's the difference, I can never remember which one's which. Um, thank you for the slides. Um, focus on form, though is reactive. That's the key thing to remember. So students are getting linguistic information at the moment that they need it. Okay, now notice the next bit. This is about an assumption. We don't know this. There's not enough research. Um, but the assumption is that acquisition occurs best when you get this information at the moment you need it. So if you don't know the word, you're kind of misforming something, your code uh, interlocutor is the word, or the person you're speaking to kind of makes a frowny face, the moment of need has ar arisen, and you're kind of ready for the input. Um, and very often, focus on form is used to refer to errors and correction, um, and very also includes post-task correction as well, rather than sort of moment-by-moment -moment interactions you make as you're speaking to people. Um, but in a sense, and I like this, Long's idea is you're kind of planting a seed because you can't prove that that little interjection, that moment when you focus on form, has, is, is going to lead to acquisition. They're not necessarily going to remember it. Our brains are complex. Two days later, it might be gone. But something is happening. There's a seed, and hopefully it grows. Um, so that's sort of focus on form. Um, when me and Nick are sort of dealing with emergent language or when I talk about it on training courses or my interpretation of it, yes, it's errors. It's errors and communicative breakdowns. So it's a sort of frowny face moments produced by students. That is emergent language, but it's not just that. Um, it's alternative ways. I've gone for some fancy ways of saying things here. And not other ways of saying the same thing. Okay, so yeah, a, a word with a similar meaning, for example, could be encoding the same meaning. So it doesn't have to be an error, it could be another way of doing the same thing. Um, it could be something that the teachers or the learners think is interesting or important. So it might be something you've noticed as you're monitoring or in a kind of private conversation you're having with the student. Uh, you just suddenly think, okay, the rest of the class would benefit from this, so you decide to share or 
sometimes a student might be the person who decides to share interesting or deemed as useful and finally it might be a question raised by a student so it's those little moments where students say things like oh what does this mean or what's this word or how do I say those are also emergent language moments so definitely not just error uh, though it seems to be sort of dealt with in that sense in the literature um, and yeah I, I do a lot of reading now in, in my job at King's and, and what's weird is there is little concrete guidance on how to implement focus on form so there's lots of ideas on how to do tasks how to get students talking there's lots of stuff on error correction but there's not much on how to focus on emergent language in the literature and there is very little published research on what teachers actually do we know a lot about sort of we can count the kind of uh, error correction moves teachers make but that's and we're sort of seeing what's most efficient but there is very little on what teachers actually do and that's what Nick set out to do he got me on board and and now there's about three or four there's three or four of us working on it and hopefully more even by the end of today um, so why do it why focus on emergent language um, well firstly you, you'll see out there the kind of the debates the, the positions people take about whether to be really explicit about language or just to sort of communicate and get input but actually unsurprisingly to most teachers working somewhere in the middle seems to be the most efficient you know a little bit of both a little bit of sort of focus on language a little bit of communication seems to be most effective um, Obviously, I'm, I'm slightly misquoting the last meta-study by, by Kang because they will talk about the fact it's actually very difficult to measure how successful communicative activities are through, in terms of acquisition and tests and stuff like that because they're communicative activities. What are you kind of noticing? But a little bit of combination seems to be most effective and we're, we're getting a, a kind of increased body of evidence about that so I think if teachers can be better at dealing with this kind of stuff we'll be able to get more evidence to suggest a little bit of both um, and Ellis talked I mean, and this goes back right back to sort of Schmidt in the 90s and before that if you're aware of a gap in your existing knowledge if there's something you can't do or you don't know how to say it or when you say it the person opposite you kind of like what are you saying you're, you're kind of sensitized to any input that comes your way because of that and I'll give you an example of this in in the next slide or, or a couple of slides at least <laughs> and just a little bit this is more not necessarily about kind of research and results and stuff like that but actually if you're just getting your students communicating and having conversations and and playing with language then you know they're experimenting they're expressing their own meanings they're finding their own voice that is another advantage anyway and if you are kind of just working on sort of inputting forms and explicit focus on language and control practice and drilling you are denying this opportunity to your students anyway this is actually a belief and and these two uh, writers from Turkey are kind of expressing that as well that when you watch students talking and communicating together you see really interesting amazing stuff so we should be doing it more anyway to take you back to the second point um, I'm about to show you a slide that I've been using on Celta Delta. I've used it in conference talks, but I, it, it's such an interesting conversation, or bit of a conversation anyway. But this idea about being attuned to the input to come. Have a look at this dialogue from a pair of students, and you can see how they really are attuned, or, or certainly ready to receive some intervention. Um, oh, by the way, what it is, is they're discussing their sort of hopes dreams and ambitions for the future and the future back then was like 2030 so it's by the time you're 30 or by 2030 or something like that so have a look and just see how ready they are Oh, 
quite, <laughs> quite the dialogue, quite the dialogue. <laughs> but it's really telling, it's really telling for a teacher to just think, we, we get this idea of, I don't know if you were ever told on, I, I was told this on my CELTRA and I've heard this many times, don't intervene, don't break the flow. You know, but I think here they're really kind of ready and you can see it in this last, this last point here where the student says to themselves, it's not that. I, I know that. <laughs> so they're ready for the input. They're kind of, they're really, really attuned to it. And I think it would be memorable to get some intervention at this point. Um, and I think, Carla, where's, where's, you had a slide where the students were saying they like the, the teacher stepping in. They like communicating and they like the teacher stepping in in the communication. I don't know whether I've just decided that's what they said, <laughs> but it was something like that. Um, okay, and, and why is this worth investigating, emergent language? Why is emergent language worth investigating? Firstly, I think if we could look at what teachers do, it will help us better identify best practice. We can kind of think, okay, that looks good, that looks good, that looks good, maybe that's not so good. And this happens within error correction a little bit with the idea that recasts, we're going to talk about recasts a bit later, perhaps not very noticeable to the person speaking, but more noticeable to the other students. So we do notice things by observing teachers and, and kind of getting data based from what we see. Um, I think it helps us better understand beliefs about working with emergent language and it's really interesting being involved in this project as a researcher and one of the teachers because actually I don't think I knew what my beliefs were once I got down to the nitty-gritty of things. I knew I thought it was good to work with emergent language but I didn't know really what I thought about how I did it. I, I was just kind of doing it and luckily I'm able to now watch myself and, and put beliefs on top of that video so they're all really sound uh, because I've kind of got the evidence for it. Um, but it's really good to know what teacher beliefs are and again as Carla was talking about if they bring those beliefs you know I've heard people talk about I don't correct my students they they just put their heads the shoulders slump and the heads go down you know that's quite a strong belief isn't it so it's nice to do this kind of stuff and talking about it it's good to help you get inside your practices. It's really interesting watching yourself teach and just thinking, why do I do that? Or why do I do that so much and why don't I do that? Uh, we'll see a little bit of, of this at the end. And the other point is, it's thought to be really skillful behavior. Now it's not, again, it's not out there in the literature that newer teachers cannot work with emergent language. But when I've talked at conferences about helping CELTA trainees work with emergent language or newer teachers work with emergent language, the question always is, is but can they? How can they? They're new teachers. Um, I think they can. But I do think it's also a, a, a skill that we do develop through experience. Surprising, because it's a skill, so you're bound to develop it through experience. But how could we speed the process up? And perhaps it's just by making people more aware of the fact that this is what we're doing, working with emergent language and how to do it. Um, it is, though, important to consider the demands on the teacher. Uh, one of the demands is it's difficult to notice language or notice a gap. And, and this is where I think it's true for inexperienced teachers. I always remember a, a trainee on a CELTA telling me it's really difficult to hear what the learners are saying because I can't switch off the noise in my own head. And, and that's, that's really very interesting. And of course you've got 30, 40 students. How do you pick out the sort of the, the best language items to work on? It, it's really, really hard. It's difficult to then decide whether it even merits any treatment because you could just ignore it. And I think um, this is, I wouldn't call this research or a study, this is just an observation. I find when I watch newer teachers, very often they're dealing with third person S, ED endings, he or she pronouns for um, d different people. And they're kind of these little morphological issues rather than more meaningful communicative breakdown issues. So does that even merit any treatment or not? That's, that's a hard thing to decide. Um, and then it's hard to decide on the best course of action um, or, or the best alternative. I'm going to show you an example later where a teacher, um, it's me actually, uh, a teacher 
gives, a, gives some language to students based on what they're saying. Nine minutes later, that same teacher thinks of a better phrase. Okay, nine minutes. You know, and, and even though I actually have found, I've been teaching for 25 years, and I think one of my stock expressions now is, oh, what's the word for that? Oh, that thingy that you... you know, it's, it's all gone a bit... It's really hard juggling my age and memory with my uh, skills. Um, it's difficult to pitch the reformulation to the right level. So sometimes we're looking at phrases given to students, and you think, well, OK, that's... What they're saying there is quite useful, but that's quite a hard way of saying it. You could just give them the sort of simpler way. So I think this, this uh, relates to lower levels a little bit. What's really, really difficult is evaluating the success of the treatment. So when you're watching a class, if they write it down or repeat it, you can say, OK, there's been some uptake. But does that mean there's going to be intake? Are they going to remember that? Again, you're, you're dealing with brains here, so it's really, really hard to see the success of anything you really do. Um, OK, so you, you get a little pit stop in a moment, but I'm just going to give you an overview of the study that me and Nick have been doing. So far, six experienced teachers. I've just realised there's another one here, but I haven't watched their video. Um, <laughs> six experienced teachers working in private language schools and in uh, an ESOL setting in Tower Hamlets. Um, we video recorded lessons and they were followed by post-lesson interviews and or stimulated recall sessions. Now that sounds really fancy. They were followed by interview sessions but they weren't very useful because you know, you've just done an hour and a half of teaching and then you're interviewed. You can't remember what's just happened in the lesson whatsoever. But actually watching yourself teach has, has yielded a lot of really, really interesting data. So then talking to the teachers um, about it, um, it is really, really interesting. And I was lucky I met the other teacher who'd, who'd watched themselves and we spent a good sort of 20, 30 minutes going, oh, did you do that? And I did that. And so that was really, really useful. And I think that might be the way we should take this research forward rather than interviewing afterwards. Um, we watched the recordings, we transcribed the whole lesson uh, and we sort of picked out instances of teachers working with emergent language. Um, so what we had to do is we then had to kind of come up with a taxonomy. I kind of, we took this idea from Lauren over there, but you were talking about communicative interactional competence. There's loads of stuff out there on ways teachers intervene and there's there's ideas used again and again, like recast, but you've got the idea of recast and reformulation. Anybody feel comfortable at the difference between a recast and a reformulation? Yeah. Uh, so there's lots and lots of um, taxonomies. Um, and I even chose one from my colleagues, Richard and Mel, who are both here today, from a really, really good blog post. I've, by the way, I, you'll see the... Uh, bibliography, list of references on the back of the handout I've given you and all the slides are available on my website and I'll give you a link to that afterwards. Um, so what we did is we, we looked at all these taxonomies and we created our own one. So I'm, I'm really proud that I'm now the owner, 50% owner of a, my own taxonomy. Um, <laughs> And I'm going to quickly run through them. I'm not sure how to do it. I'm wondering whether just to let you... What shall I do? Get, you, do you want to get together and talk about them, or shall I just quickly run through them? Run through them. <laughs> we were just doing it now. We were doing it now. OK, so just turn to a partner. <laughs> just have a quick look at that, and then any questions. I'll give you about three minutes. Then any questions, and I'll make some points about some differences. Yes, you have to read, yes. I'll switch, I'll pop them up. Oh. They all are, if you want to, yeah. yeah. I'm now correct. I'm not going to say that. 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 I'm
I've never heard of recast. Eh? Oh really, really? Recast is probably the one that's most in the literature. <laughs> uh, it's that it's that sort of echo of what the student said, but uh, a kind of upgraded version is. But it's called reformulation and it's called recast, but we felt... I've heard recast in relation to correcting, reformulation in connection to upgrading. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So we've decided to change the parameters, because a recast is a reformulation. So it's really awkward to have the two phrases. Which ones cause a problem? For... Well, that's the next activity, that's the next one. Uh, Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're, you're one step ahead of the game. And then I definitely do a dissertation, um, recalls, and sharing. Right, right. But no issues with the terms, no issues with the ideas. No, I wouldn't have any issues with the terms, ideas? Are you happy with those? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the most common when people observe, yeah. Well, in the literature it's the most common, so it's that sort of echo of what the student said. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, the term in the, some people's literature, but we've decided to keep the term. Yeah, because it's... I don't know, it's, I guess it's kind of like, I don't know, why we cast, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, as I've handed over to you, have a look at the next two questions, because what I should have done is gone through them and then made you discuss, but now you can discuss these as well, and then we'll do the feedback. Yeah. <laughs> don't need it, don't need it. <laughs> so hot. Which ones do you guys reckon you use the most? Do you know? Mm, mm, yeah. You don't know, do you? Yeah, it's really, really weird, isn't it? You don't really know what we're doing, and uh, that's what I found when I watched it. Yeah, and also. Well, they kind of think that um, if they say, what do you mean, they'll kind of be either going to embarrass the student or they're going to be downgraded. And so, yeah, it's really... I don't know what question to ask, because I feel yeah, like sometimes maybe students don't know what they mean themselves, so they're so lost. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Well, that might be good judgment, though, because sometimes we do have to kind of go... Uh, sometimes we do have to sort of stand there going, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah right, yeah, 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 I think so, yeah. 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 Ah, right, so this is going to be really different for you anyway, so... Seven-year-old, we're going to talk about the expression of well-rounded individuals. Yeah. And one of the girls said, oh, does that mean that you've completed the world? Oh. And I was trying to find out what she meant, but I wasn't quite sure where to go. She, like, I didn't know how to elicit, like, what yeah, she yeah, 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 yeah. So they were just in the school. But I suppose if, yeah, okay, I, but I guess they don't understand. So this is what we would say would be, uh, oh, where is it? Uh, learn a preemptive. Um, so it's the student saying, does, is it, does it mean that? And basically the answer is no. Yeah, yeah it means, yeah. So well, that's quite no a, and then just clarify. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it gives, you, it gives you the right to clarify it, yeah. I think. Because, well, you'll see that that's what teachers kind of do. Well, that, that's, 
why that's the problem with the literature because it kind of a lot of it says that one is a recast is a type of reformulation but that's really I mean it's silly I suppose is is why I have again it's like focus on form focus on forms so what we've decided I'm going to say to everyone in a moment is that we have decided that uh, reformulation is when the, the you and the learner the learner is aware that something requires a change okay, okay. whereas a recast is it just you, 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 say, it. you say it and yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. and the literature does suggest that it's the least efficient and one of the most common yeah. Well, they, loads of people use it interchangeably, yeah, 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 Because yeah, yeah, yeah. a reformulation doesn't actually have to be an error either. So if you're recasting something that's not an error, you're echoing. So how do students know if you're correcting or just validating what they've just said? So it's really quite complicated. Okay, everybody, okay. Right. Good, good. I always find my technique is wait for someone to say shush. Because <laughs> yeah, I'm sort of trained not to. Um, I think most people are quite happy with the terms, but I think the one that causes most difficulty and it definitely causes most difficulty in the literature or the two are reformulations and recasts because they're used interchangeably and so one can mean the other. So what we've decided for our ta taxonomy is that the reformulation is explicit. Okay, so if you say something like, mm, no, you can't, or that's the wrong word, or any kind of indication to the learner that what they've said needs to be changed in some way or is problematic in some way that's a reformulation whereas a recast is just that sort of echo so the learner says something and you recast it by just giving them the correct or more appropriate or more effective form um, in the literature it's quite interesting a lot of studies into recasts uh, possibly the most common form of um, correction that's done but also considered to be potentially the least effective because students aren't no the student who's speaking isn't noticing it but it has been shown by recent research and I think it's Lee and Saito or it's one of the things on the on the list of references I've given you that actually peers notice recast quite a lot so it can be effective but the other problem with recast is if teachers are also echoing so students say something and the teacher kind of repeats it to validate what they said or worrying that the other students haven't heard it then basically you've created a situation where you're dealing with accurate, appropriate, you know, well-formed language and incorrect, inappropriate, ineffective language in the same way so students wouldn't know the difference so we think it's important to have a bit of a difference um, we also think that with communicative recast we need to change the term so I th we're going to change it to interactional recast and I think uh, Lauren you might agree that Mann and Walsh would like that more because it's about kind of keeping the interaction going while sort of making a change but you'll see later on uh, it, there's potential for it not to be super effective um, I'm not going to ask you, a, a lot of people were giving me the, inter, um, the intervention types they use, but the people at the back we were talking to, I was talking to there said, well I don't really know which ones I use. And that's the fascinating thing, you probably don't. Okay, it's kind of a trick question, because it wasn't until I watched myself and counted the 77 interventions I made uh, during the lesson, and it was 77. Wow. Um, <laughs> it's now and a half lesson. Uh, 77 interventions. So to categorise them was really surprising what came out top and actually what came out bottom was, was perhaps most surprising. Reasons for doing so, you probably don't know that either because yeah. it's really hard to think. You've got so much to think about. Um, 
couple of interesting findings before I hand over the next task. Firstly, that all the teachers we worked with were really happy just to have really good extended communicative stages. So there's a lot of emerging language happening in these classes. So really, really rich environments for learner language, uh, emergent language. Uh, but we also found out that you're, it's, it's more common that teacher, teachers are using more than one intervention at the same time. They're using one to bounce off on the other, off the other. So that's the actual pair work I've given you. Uh, it's coming up now. I'm going to give you a handout. Um, so I just got told my instructions weren't very good last time, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you the handout. Um, so, ten intervention types, some exchanges, okay. Um, I've done the first one for you. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So what I want, so you can, uh, there's m often more than one intervention type at any one time, in any one exchange, and you don't have to use an intervention type once. In a way, explicit reformulation happens again and again and again. So with a partner, and I'm only going to give you five minutes because I think I've only got 25 to go, just can you work out what the intervention types are? Okay, could I get you to pass back from the front? Could you pass back from the back? Thank you. Can you pass them to... Oh, can you, Andrew, can you pass them back from the back? <laughs> I still rush them. <laughs> On camera. <laughs> No, it's okay. I'm joking. Is all these in the context of the whole class or in the context of you monitoring or both? This is all, these are all these of what we've seen so far. So, okay, so these, the these dialogues have come from uh, a number of observations that we've done. Yeah. But these are the, the ten are the only ten we've seen. Okay. Oh, so there are only ten as far as we can see at the moment. Especially if you include translation as fitting in with anything yeah. um, but, I, mean, the I don't the in different classes uh, okay sometimes you'll see so when you get to here uh, you'll see how this is delayed okay yeah whereas this is this is monitoring this is monitoring okay. and others are more open so it can happen any time in a class yeah yeah I can maybe point that out yeah mm. A student is asking the other student, and they're in the middle of like, so they're involved in teaching that person. Maybe if you do one together, move on, one together, move on. Yeah, I, yeah, I do. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's learner preemptive, learner preemptive, but of course there's um, explicit uh, reformulation because the learners ask for it. So that's kind of always there in a way. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And we saw quite a few of them learners preemptive, which is good. Oh, those students who don't fill in the gaps, like me. Yeah. No, no, I don't write. I wait for the answers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. What do you think? Is that correct? Second. Uh, sure, sure, Number three. Is that correct, Shahida? Ah, okay. It's the underlying ones. Sorry, I knew. So it's those ones. Yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. So that one would be the learner preemptive. Yeah, 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 yeah. But of course, at a time, so the, I think in a way, the teacher saying, is that correct? Perhaps you could argue it's more eliciting than confirmation. But also remember, it's not what the, they're not correcting what the learner said. They're correcting the, sorry, they're working with the, no, they're asking the student that said they, that knew the word. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Shahida, 
I presume is student nine. Uh, yeah. No, it is student nine. But yeah. How is it? Easy, difficult? Gemma. Well, you've got Gemma, you've got Gemma. And I'm walking down. Okay. Well, maybe someone. How are you getting on? Any thoughts? Which ones? Yeah, it is, yeah, the second one, yeah? Yeah, 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 because there's, there's a little moment where they just think, what, what, what is this, what, what word do I want? Yeah, lovely. I think always there's probably some element of explicit reformulation coming in, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the second one is as well, but it's harder to see it because you obviously can't hear the kind of intonation of, is make it right, yeah, yeah. I think it's, it is a recast. So you've got the you've got the preemptive there, followed by the recast, which is actually quite common. Yeah. The, the learner says they don't get it, so the teacher so the, and then you switches this, into kind of recast it's mode. A, a mood where you, yeah. yeah. Uh, so moves where you. It's like uh, a move. Yeah, that's yeah. what they are. They're kind of like little moves. If they actually... No, because we don't think it's a valid move. Because what's it for? Yeah, because yeah. You, 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 yeah. Can't, you can't say that some people measure that as uptake. It's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. I mean, who's to measure that actually yeah. mm. it means anything? But there's another reason we haven't got echo on there. It's because no one's doing it. Really? Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah, well, possibly. So they kind of wean themselves off echoing. I don't yeah. know. Um, so yeah, that was a really interesting finding, but we had no echo. Well, the function of, of an echo yeah. is for correction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which one? Yeah. Is that actually? Well, we're calling that an interactional recast. Oh, sorry, an interactional. Yeah, but. No one's, the thing is, what we notice about that one is no one notices them. So you're kind of reformulating what they're saying, but you're keeping the conversation going. Well, no, exactly, yeah. So it's, is the teacher thinking that needs to be corrected? Well, you do, but they're not, it's hard to recall them, yeah. What do you do in the classroom like we were doing the conversation with them, like surprise? Yeah, for the whole school. Yeah, so it's hard to tell. So you can't go through each one. So I think that teaches like loads and loads of versions, but they use them quite a lot. So whether they are correcting or not is, is we don't really know. Um, but what they are doing is keeping the conversation going. But what we did find, every time they're doing it, no one's noticing anyway. And actually in this one, they kind of go, yeah, oh, where is it? Uh, Until you develop the, the whole school, the yeah, not allowed. So they don't even think, so this, 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 their responses, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically doing all this all the time. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And I think the last ones are very highlighted. So any kind of, you'll see when they start to highlight. So it, what's interesting is how they see two modes of a lesson. Okay, right, right. Okay, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to give your answers <laughs> uh, because it's quite tricky. And all of these have been kind of cross checked by the two of us, me and Nick. So I'm going to kind of run through these a little bit. Um, Clarification request is the first one. What do you mean? Interesting to see experienced teachers doing this quite a lot. And I think it makes me think that whenever a teacher asks you, when do you correct? I would say, I can't remember who said this, but I heard a, another person in a talk say this once, look for the frowny faces. And you have, you have a rationale for doing it. Um, 
So yeah, what do you mean? This is the example where nine minutes later, I thought uh, they're not paying attention was actually what the learner meant. Uh, and, and that was the phrase we chose to agree on. Uh, but it was interesting that a number of interventions followed clarification requests. So it's almost like you get this switch in mode from communication to form. The focus on form happens because there's something during the focus on meaning that requires you to switch. So it suggests that once you're kind of quite experienced, you start to prioritize moments of breakdown rather than incidental error. Uh, and that was an interesting finding. Uh, this one was uh, learner preemptive. Obviously, there's some um, reformulation happening too. It's learner preemptive because the learner is asking, actually, two learners in this case are asking for some help here. And again, you see that switch from meaning. She's describing the time uh, her niece, I think, fell off a roof while trying to pick a guava. Um, and the switch then means that the teacher starts to, well actually other students start dealing with form and very interesting to see here that then the learner carries on the story there's uptake in this instance so these little moments where meaning switches to uh, form focus on meaning switches to focus in form quite ripe for, um, for um, uptake not intake but uptake um, and here's another example, and I included this one because this idea of sort of playing with language and learners being themselves. This is a Saudi student who they weren't allowed to bring uh, phones into their schools. schools, so they found ways of sort of having contraband phones <laughs> in the school. And, and she uses this idea about, you know, it's like bringing in drugs to prison or whatever. Um, and you get this little switch from meaning to form. So she's make it, make it, even though she has used the word hide already. And the teacher then corrects and the student mispronounces and the teacher um, corrects again and the, the learner repeats. They then carry on the story. Um, so quite a few learner preemptive interventions. So as you were saying, learners like that they're quite interested in, in getting um, input from teachers, uh, learners want to fine-tune their messages. They're, they're not all, always happy with what they're saying. They want to say it better. Um, and lots of instances where uh, there's uptake afterwards. They recognize the switch. And we actually saw very few examples of recasts in our study so far, um, but the ones we did see always follow a switch from meaning to form. So the teachers are recasting when the, 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 the mode, I guess, the mode changes from one to the other. And that was really, really interesting. Um, this was a communicative recast, or, or as we want to call it, an interactional recast. And Andrew, you were sort of saying, would you bother with the, all the schools? So it's hard to know necessarily here, without going through each one with the teacher, is that what? Are they just keeping the conversation doing, or do they think the whole school is better? And you don't know, basically. It's, it's kind of, well, I just, I just said it. But it's interesting to see there's quite a lot of this, and there's usually no uptake on it. Uh, this comes from a student saying that in their school in Russia, um, they'd taken videos of the teachers kind of freaking out about something and posted them on Facebook. And, and the teacher says, the student says, now you're going to make us put away. And they says, yeah, I'm going to ban mobile phones. So they're kind of, they are upgrading, but it's not really noticed. So it's a, but it's a recast, but it's happening as part of the communicative act. So we think it's valuable to separate the two types of recast. Because I think rather than just going, ban mobile phones, that's the end of the conversation, I think. But this keeps it going. Um, but they're not... They're kind of errors that you might not think are worth focusing on, or, or whether you'd call them errors at all. And you'll see later on a very, very interesting finding. Um, this was a recall. 
And this is going back to that slide where I talked about how hard it is juggling everything. You're not just juggling what's happening in the class, you're remembering what you've taught in other classes and thinking, oh, this might be useful for this class here. So here the students are talking about teachers seizing mobile phones and the, the teacher think it's, thinks it's better to use the word confiscate. So they sort of switch now into kind of teaching mode. So rather than sort of pre-teaching seize and confiscate, they're just waiting for the moment where it's worth discussing the two because it's, it's happened. Um, the next one is extensions. Um, this is, uh, Cathy, you asked earlier, when in the lesson is this happening? It's, it's open conversation, it's monitoring, it's, it's during monitoring and post-feedback. Extensions were very often when the teacher was stepping up to the board and starting to sort of play with what occurred. So I can imagine here really very tired, sleepy, um, and in the next one, chatted to, spoke to, talked to someone on the phone type thing. So the extensions very often, again, this sort of little switch in teacher mode where they came over here and started showing off their board skills, really. Um, and then, but you'll see then there's, there's some getting the students to repeat as well. So it's a switch in mode from communication, well here, from language to communication, perhaps more so. Another example of learner preemptive. Learner preemptives often moved into more metalinguistic work. Here, uh, we think perhaps the issue is the private privacy. The student can't, can't quite see what privacy is because it doesn't sound anything like private. We've got a lot of sort of vowel changes there. So here the teacher thinks it's worth saying what privacy is. Um, perhaps expecting the, you know, um, privacy it's the noun of private, presuming that, assuming that the teacher, the student, knows private. So again, little switch. Student's trying to say something, can't, and the teacher moves into sort of teaching mode, as it were. Uh, the last sharing, um, and this I think is really, really interesting. This is the delayed correction slot. Uh, as it were, and the teachers starting with things like, I like this one, this is sharing because they think it's a good expression, uh, and then going back to this idea of right and wrong, what we found really interesting is that no incidents of teachers saying, no you can't say that or that's not right, they hedged a lot, I'd go with this, I'd say this. Um, so one of the findings, loads of hedging, loads and loads of hedging. So yeah, I'd go with this, for me this sounds more natural. My colleague Martin Dewey though says, who are you to decide what's natural? So actually it's a really complex area um, because you know, in a lingua franca context, what is, what is the, best, the best way? So again, I think maybe looking for the frowny faces is key. Right, I better zoom on. Um, so here are Obviously it's research, so we've got our calculators out, uh, this is data. Um, very interesting that sort of, very often there's these sort of explicit moments where you're, you're moving from the communication to the language work and you're being very explicit about it. So right at the bottom of the heap, what studies show to be the most common way of working with errors is actually in the, what we've seen so far is the least common way. And, and you know, what does this suggest? That the more experienced you get, you, are you basing it on your knowledge of the literature? Do you, have you decided over the years that it's not efficient? That's what we really want to find out. Um, I'm going to ignore that. Because um, we'll hopefully we'll have time in a moment. So some tips. Okay, because I, I want this to be practical. Um, I strongly recommend recording your classes and using this brand new taxonomy um, to observe and categorise the interventions you make. And, and that's, Lauren, what you've been doing with sort of communicative turns, interactional turns in the, in the classroom. But when you do it, do consider your wait time too. Because it's interesting, when you see teachers jumping in quite quickly, that's when they, you can see them sort of then going to the board and writing up a better word. So I think there's nothing wrong with taking a little moment to consider your actions. And then 
also noting what students are doing with your interventions. Are they writing things down? Are they repeating them? Are they continuing what they're saying using the form you gave them? So what's actually happening when you intervene? And it's really, really interesting because you'll see some students who just sit there the whole lesson and don't write anything down. Others are just noting everything you do. Their eyes are on you the whole time. And you make one intervention, they're writing it down. Okay. And I think have stimulated recall sessions. Now, I was really lucky that me and uh, a teacher called Richard, a uh, different Richard, um, met um, a few weeks ago at another conference and really talked about what we'd found and we were really interested in the similarities and the fact that we didn't recast and it was like, why not? It's really, really interesting. So I would recommend doing this with a peer. So you both video yourselves, do the counts or maybe count each other, do the counts yourselves perhaps. Um, but then I think, or send your recordings to me. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to sound like years and years. Did you watch years and years? Yeah. You can be data. Okay. Yeah. Fine. You know. okay. Um, taking this from Mel and Richard's blog post, I really like this idea of, of what the student said, what I would say. Because I think it's really, I don't think it's right for us to decide on standards. Okay. I think when you're working in London it's a little bit easier because you could kind of think about what's perhaps most common here. But I think if you're teaching internationally in a lingua franca context, what is the more effective term? It's really, really hard to think of. So I think I quite like what I would say because that's, that's what you would say. That's probably your, your best, most logical, you know, just the right frame of reference I think. So I think really good idea to record your students doing tasks, okay, uh, so that then you could do the emergent language work the next day using this template to kind of think about what you would say. And um, yeah, use it to record the reformulations, but also think, do I deal with this one? Is this worth dealing with and how am I going to deal with it? So you're just taking the time to think about the language work you do because uh, it's really hard to do it live so now you get that little moment where you can do that so you could do task feedback at the end of the task and then do the sort of language feedback I think this also puts a, a methodology like PPP back in the game because you always get people talk about the limited time you get for the communicative practice well you could have it and then deal with the language afterwards so you sort of switch modes that way um, an example here, this is a, a, a newer teacher who did that, they recorded themselves, oh, sorry, they recorded their students doing a task. What stood out for them was obviously the past simple forms, but they also said they'd noticed something that they'd never seen from the students before, that during the interactions there wasn't much, uh-huh, oh, okay, yeah, they were kind of sitting in silence while another student spoke. So they noticed something about their class that they felt they really needed to intervene on. So yeah, they reviewed past forms, but they started to help the students start to sort of listen more effectively and, and ask for clarification more effectively and, you know, because they were just kind of sitting there while one person talked. So you've got these really long pauses. Uh, a couple of un unanswered questions. We don't know how effective focus on form is. A lot of theoretical stuff. So I've only been at King's full time for about six months, but more research is needed. It's a really frustrating thing to say, but we just don't have enough. We don't know enough about how effective it is. We really, really don't. And how do learners respond? We really need to know more about what is most effective by looking at them. Um, and more perhaps unified tasks as well. What we're seeing is teachers just kind of if you looked at the boards afterwards, you couldn't necessarily say what the lesson was about. But if you had more unified tasks, or their emerging language moments, like six or seven in the lesson, whereas unified tasks, you'd have a little bit, a little bit more. And task repetition, though obviously you've got issues then with boredom and students wondering why they're doing the same thing again. So you could really look at issues of uptake. Um, 
I do have time for questions, but I just moved from that slide. So, uh, thank you, yes. If you, the slides and handouts are on my website. I've changed it three times today, so I don't, don't know what version's up there, but it's more or less what you saw today. Uh, so yeah, if you want to get the slides, they're all there, and the handouts are there too. Um, five minutes for questions, we've got five? Yeah, five minutes for questions. <laughs> I have a look, I do, um, I'm worried it's a stupid question, so sorry. Um, but you mentioned like English as a lingua franca, and I was just wondering if perhaps like, have, do you know if there's much research or if you've done much on whether different contexts of different. language, different contexts of learning language, is different types of um, emergent language with it works. So, you know, like ELF versus EFL or academic. Or well, there's, there's not much research out there. That's the thing about how teachers deal with emergent language. But when you're looking at research, probably English as a lingua franca context is the richest area. Um, it's, it's a really good area to research because what you're seeing is teachers being able to move between modes. So, somewhere like Singapore, where you've got kind of this, this you've got Singlish and you've got this kind of. Um, this, this English that's considered to be better, you'll see students together will use a lot of Singlish and then when they're talking to the teacher they're using these more standard forms. So what you're seeing is that they're not necessarily, you know, what is an error? It's, it's throwing it up in the air rather than giving us these really sort of important I sort of things. Just, I was just wondering, with you know, things like IELTS and Cambridge, where the focus of the exam is so much on accuracy, yeah, so yeah, yeah. from a general English or EL, EFL context, that then something where accuracy is very important, is there a different yeah. way to... Well, you'd have to do the same thing. I guess it would be with the speaking paper, yeah. rather than other input towards reading or listening. Um, but yeah, you'd have to, you'd probably see maybe more explicit reformulations where they're looking at standard forms based on passing an exam. So it would be very interesting to look at IELTS and see what teachers do differently. No, not into IELTS. <laughs> no, because also it's not really, you're looking at classrooms where you want interaction, as you saw with that Turkish paper, where students are allowed to play and interact and, and so you really are dealing with what emerges from the communication rather than what is required to pass an exam because then you're kind of dealing with standards so it's not really I mean I think it would be interesting to see what teachers how teachers switch modes perhaps but I wonder if they're more in a kind of teaching mode most of the time anyway so it would be interesting but you could do that yeah. no because it would be really interesting but yeah, 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 yeah. any others well, dissertation. Yeah. It's good dissertation. Really good dissertation. The teachers that recorded all of this, were they aware that you were looking for? Oh. Were you aware of what we were looking for? Yes, you knew it was about emerging language, didn't you? Yeah. Were the teachers who were recorded aware of what they were looking for? So I was. I was. Oh, but we didn't know, we were, that's what we were looking for, that's what we found. Were you aware of what we were looking for? It was just focus on form, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. In terms of criteria, you No. But you kind of... But you knew not to sort of do an extensive reading or yeah, lots of control yeah. practice or a writing activity because yeah. it wouldn't have... So they had to sort of... It had to be kind of task-based, didn't it, Rich? Um, sort of tasky, yeah, so meaning-y... I, I knew it was task-based Yeah, yeah. But we didn't really Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was more kind of based around... Yeah, 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 that's right, yeah, 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 because yeah. that would alter the data, but I think if you ever, if you did this as something like a dissertation or as, I shouldn't say this on camera, if I get shoehorned into doing this as a PhD, um, 
I probably do have to find out what teachers' beliefs are first before I watch them teach, but not necessarily give them the, criteria, the uh, taxonomy before they teach. So I think teachers would have to be more aware for that. But I knew all, I, all Nick wanted to see was how I work with learner contributions. But there was no taxonomy until we watched the videos. Yeah. So the taxonomy, there's 10 things because we saw 10 things. Uh, by the way, someone asked me, Echo, who asked me about Echo? Echo's not on there because we don't see any Echo, which is really interesting. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. really interesting. From, for, I can do both. Simon, can I do two more questions, three more questions? Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if you specifically chose certain levels to, to video and if the results were different levels. Uh, they're slightly different. I can put the elementary and intermediate slides up on, um, I think they might be the version on my website does have both. Um, but no recasts are low in both. Um, and I think uh, there's more what do you mean at sort of intermediate type levels than there are at elementary because, um, but that could have been, because also elementary teachers might be just going, huh? <laughs> so we didn't record the facial expressions, but we should have because it's, it's, it's a clarification request. Uh, but we've got elementary, intermediate, and the ESOL class is that mix of they're called elementary in the ESOL, but you look at the stories they're telling and you think, that's not the elementary I know. Yeah, I've got one and one first before. Does that answer the question? Yes. Sir. Yeah, yeah. I, I had two and I can't remember my second question. I think the first one was, when you, it's just a thing, uh, when you say recast, so, I kind of get the difference between that and explicit reformulation, mm, but mm. I, would, I, I would often recast with my face and gesture and intonation to show that an error is being made. Mm, so does mm. that count in the explicit reformulation or not? Well, it's not linguistically there. Yeah. It's so there. So it's not there at the moment because you can't see it. You can't see it because you've kind of got the teacher face on uh, to the students. So I think any face, uh, a facial move or a pronunciation move yeah. would for us be a clarification request. But if the learner's not noticing it, I would see it as a recast. It's really hard to separate them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we think if it's explicit, reformulation is a more useful term. Okay. And if it's kind of just there and everyone moves on. Right, so if it's a really targeted recast. Yeah, 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 like yeah, yeah, yeah. Draconian yeah. and my teacher yeah. <laughs> yeah. went. You well, know. well, yes. So <laughs> grammatical ones are very often not noticed with pronunciation. So I think if, if the teacher's kind of big on pronunciation, mm -hmm. I reckon you'll see much more recasts. Because okay. the literature does show that pronunciation recasts are noticed more than any other type. Oh. Yeah. 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 Did you have a question? I do have a recast. Oh, yes. <laughs> Oh my god. Okay. I mean, they know what's going on. Okay. Cara, do you? I It's just because if you've got an hour and a half, we want as much data as we can get. I, I think it's more, it's more that, because I think after a re, so what we want to do eventually, and I, God knows how long this will take, is different levels, different types of lesson, different contexts, and because I'd imagine in a reading lesson, you'll probably get a lot more learner preemptive, for example, so that would give us something to, uh, so, but are they preempting if the co if the questions don't let them do it? So what we wanted straight away from the beginning is lots of data. Yeah. Yeah. I can't hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you did a dictogloss, for example, it would be that's this sort of endless cycle. So we thought it would be good in the sort of meaning focused work on the communicative level first to give us the data and then start going off. But it's going to have to be other people who do that. That's the thing, yeah. Stop. One more. I have to do one more. Go on. One, can I do one more? Simon, can I do one more? One more. Yeah. How do you, I think one of the skills 
teachers is actually understanding what a student is trying to say yeah. in order to be able to do mastery. Yeah. And I think that's one of the hardest things mm. that yeah. teachers to do because they just don't understand. Right. So on training courses, it would be really good to use this data to show students that it's saying, what do you mean, is a really powerful move. And so I think new teachers are often afraid to do it, so they kind of go, yeah, <laughs> yeah, or I'll tell you later when a student asks a question. So if they see, so that's this idea of, well, I had it on one of the slides, of feeding into best practice. I think that's where this has an impact, is that new teachers have to see that it's okay to not understand, or to at least stop pretending that we understand. Because we've, we've got the sort of accent repertoire, and the, we've heard students say the same stuff again and again and again. So just go, yeah, yeah, you're right, yeah. But really what we should be doing all the time is going, sorry, I don't what you're saying even if we do because we think maybe other people don't or or wouldn't out there so I, I better stop so uh, yeah I've gone over yes yeah,